Perfect. Great. Thank you, Holly. Um, well, hello and welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, for today's call, well, just some housekeeping stuff. For today's call, if you could plan to use the Q&A function for questions, we'd really appreciate that. And we're going to have two breaks for questions, one that'll come after our presenter panel, and then also at the end of the meeting today, and um, grant staff will definitely linger. And I think our presenters will be able to stay on the call too, just to ensure that all the questions get answered should we run out of time. We do wanna make sure that we at least finish up the presentations by noon so you can be on your way. Um, but again, we will all stay on the call to make sure we answer any questions that we haven't addressed. Um, we do have closed captioning available today. We're trying out um, a new transcription service for the first time just to allow everyone to participate more fully. We have already received a little bit of feedback on it that it is probably not of the highest quality and we're going to look for something. Uh, we're going to pursue some other services, but um, if, you, if you can check out the transcription service that we're using and Holly will tell you where to find it, we definitely would love your feedback on it. So thank you for that. And Holly, did you just want to let people know where to find that? Um, yes, at the bottom of your screen or wherever your Zoom toolbar is, there should be something that either says closed captioning or live transcript. And if it's not, it, you can also find it under more. So you can view the full transcript, which will show up on the side, uh, kind of like the chat box would or the or, uh, participants would. Um, you can show it as a subtitle so it goes below. Um, the words. Uh, if you want to try it and see it, if you can't find it, if you want to just um, put something in the chat box, I will see it and I will try to help you. Great. Thanks, Holly. So I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge that the Summer at Your Library project is a program of the of California Library Association supported by IMLS under the provisions of LSTA and it's administered in California by the state librarian. Um, and then also, just so you know, following the webinar, probably early next week, we'll be sending out a link to the webinar, which is being recorded today, and a list of all the resources that were mentioned in today's meeting, plus an additional list of some um, grab-and-go programming resources. Um, and I think that's it for um, housekeeping. And just for people that came in, recently in the last couple of minutes, just hello and welcome. Thank you for being here. And we are so happy you are joining us. Um, we do have a lot of information we'd like to share with you today and we are gonna try to fit it all in um, on the call. In addition to all of our amazing attendees, we've got the Lunch at the Library project team, myself, Trish Garone, Carrie Johnson and Holly McChris. Um, and also on the call is Natalie Cole, the California State Library Bureau Chief, as well as our four amazing presenters, Patrice Chamberlain, the CLA Project Manager of the Early Nutrition and Learning Project, Christine Kingsbury from Tahama County Library, Rachel Acaza from Sonoma County Library, and Dawn Vest of Monterey County Free Libraries. Um, and before we just get started with our presentation workshop info session, Natalie, I don't know if you had a quick word you wanted to say. Thank you, Trish. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for being here and joining the webinar. And thank you to um, the project team for organizing this and to the speakers. And also a huge thank you for all the libraries that take part in lunch at the library. Um, you know, we are really pleased to be able to support Lunch at the Library through LSTA funding this year. And of course, we are delighted that Lunch at the Library is included in the governor's proposed budget um, as an ongoing item for future years. Um, but in the meantime, um, we do strongly encourage you to be in, in touch with Trish and with Carrie for the opportunities that they're making available through with the summer at your library slash lunch at the library project this year with LSTA funds, because we do want to support you um, in any way we can and help you participate in the project. And then just to reiterate, thank you so much for um, participating in lunch at the library and helping to bring meals and learning enrichment opportunities to your communities. And back to you, Trish. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. 
So just a quick overview of our time together today. And just to mention, looking over the registration list, we've got some on the call that are, or a lot on the call that are already serving as summer meal sites at their libraries. We also have quite a few library jurisdictions that are not serving meals at their libraries, but that have taken pop-up library programming out to community meal sites. And we also have a few library jurisdictions on the call that it looks like haven't served meals or been involved in pop-up library programming out at meal sites that may be considering participating. So for those libraries that are already serving some of summer meals, um, some of the information you'll hear today may not be new to you, um, but we just wanna make sure we're bringing everybody up to speed and we have a real mixture of experience with summer meal programs on the call. Um, there is no way for us to cover everything about uh, California Library summer meal programs in an hour and a half. So we really want you to consider your experience today as like a lunch at the library calling card or business card. We, we really want the big takeaways for you to be that you're aware of the lunch at the library project and its resources and that there are project staff ready to answer questions help connect you with resources and in developing partnerships that might feel challenging. Um, we are here to serve you so you can better serve your communities. So um, we really want you to leave the call knowing that when things come up, uh, you reach out to us and we will do all we can to assist. Um, the other big thing we want you to know, and we'll follow up with this later in the meeting, the project does have funds available for summer 2021 to support library meal programs in the form of LSTA reimbursement funds. I'm sorry, L I'm sorry, LSTA reim um, reimbursement funds to support the purchase of library um, summer meal programming activities and materials. And we'll go into that in later detail, but on the Lunch at the Library website, there's a page that has information on that and a link to apply for those funds. We want to make sure you know that. And then also we have four really wonderful presenters and we really hope that um, the presentations that they share with you will really uh, prove to be useful with your own work and hopefully it will really serve as an inspiration to those libraries that are not yet engaged in summer meal programs um, to consider doing so. So again, we're gonna try covering as much as we can, but there's gonna be a lot of things we really just encourage you to follow up with program staff. So our contact information will be at the end. So please be in touch. Um, so Holly, if you could just advance to the next slide. Uh, I just really quickly wanted to do a recap of summer 2021, summer 2020 and the time of COVID and um, really all that libraries uh, achieved in California um, around summer meals. And the, this infographic is available on the Lunch at the Library website. Um, but let's see, over 296, 6,000 summer meals were served by public libraries. Um, library jurisdictions took pop-up library services out to over 390 community meal sites. Um, you can see over 176,000 free books were given out to support the development of home libraries and over 180,000 family engagement activity kits were given out by libraries. Um, Holly, if you could advance. And also a lot of, we were able to support libraries that continued their work beyond summer and continued um, either at pop-up sites or at library meal sites to support their communities in the fall. Also this fall um, infographic is also on the Lunch at the Library website. And next slide. And this, this really is designed to just show the growth of the program. And even in the time of COVID, um, in 2020, 
more meals were served than in 2019 or any other year as long as the you know for as long as the lunch at the library program has been in existence though less than half of the number of sites were open to serve meals as compared to 2019 again more meals were served in 2020 and the number of pop-up libraries more than tripled between 2019 and 2020 so though most libraries doors were shut were were, were closed um, california libraries really did amazing things um, in their communities uh, next slide holly and at this point i'm going to hand things over to carrie who's going to talk about the um, need for summer meals um, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the Summer Meals Program, partnerships, and how to get started with your Summer Meals Program. As many of you know, during the summer, many children and teens are at home and have a lack of quality, healthy food resources. This is one of the reasons why libraries play such an important role in nutrition and also access to food. The library is the ideal partnership and place to meet community needs and provide engagement activities while providing free, healthy, and nutritious meals. Based on data we've seen, we know that the Lunch at the Library program can expand and needs to expand. This is especially significant during the pandemic with the lack of healthy food resources in communities, and it also highlights the need for quality nutrition resources. So a little bit about getting started. Um, oh, and Holly, next slide, please. I'm sorry, we forgot to move on to this. So a little bit about getting started. The Summer Meals Program is a federally funded program and services are typically only offered in the summer. Due to the pandemic, we have had a lot of flexibility with the current program and waivers have helped libraries expand and even extend services beyond summer, reaching greater into the community. If interested in starting the program, the first step is to determine if you're eligible to be a site. And the second is to partner with the meals provider. And there's a number of ways, and we'll talk a little bit more about partnerships um, a little later on in the presentation. But this is an important piece because if you've not started the conversation and have not connected with the meals provider, it is best to do this early and connect with the partner to get the conversation started. This is something that we could also help assist with. I could help you assist with connecting to different community partners within um, your own community. Okay, next slide, Holly. In our communities, many children rely on school lunches to provide nutritious food to help them grow healthy mentally and also physically. When school is out for the summer or during this extended period of time, this source of food often disappears and parents and youth have a lack of access to healthy food and free engagement activities. This is where the library comes into play. It is a way for children, teens, and families to acquire nutrition and educational resources. With school closures, a large number of families are also out of work and the pandemic has worsened food insecurity epidemic. California produces nearly half of the nation's fruit and vegetables yet one in seven children struggle with food insecurity. Food insecurity is the occasional or consistent lack of access to the food one needs to grow healthy and have an active life. Food insecurity also has serious impacts on individuals' well-being, which may result in poor school attendance and performance and physical and mental health problems. Individuals struggling with food insecurity may also have to make tough decisions that no one should ever have to face. No family should have to decide between buying groceries or paying rent, and no parent should have to skip a meal in order for their children to eat. During these tough times, libraries can support families. And as we've seen the great work you did this past summer, libraries are supporting families. Next slide, Holly. Many families struggle, as we know, to get through the summer months with lack of food access. The library really is a bridge to those services. The library helps promote nutrition, obesity prevention, and also helps prevent learning loss. Learning loss, especially during the pandemic, could have a negative impact on youth. Adding to the challenge, schools and daycare centers are now closed due to COVID-19, which means 
families who rely on free reduced cost school breakfast, lunch, snacks, and even dinner to feed their children are facing a greater need and challenges with accessing food. Additionally, obesity is a factor in the summer months and obesity risks increase without access to healthy food or a safe place even to be active. Also during the summer, we, are, um, we see learning loss as we're very familiar with the libraries. In California, the effects of school closures on academic progress appears greater for English learners and students from low income families. During this period of time, it is now referred to as the COVID-19 slide, and educators are learning a lot on how to combat the slide from what we already know from our summer slide data. The library has become even a more important partner during these very difficult times that we're facing. Next slide. Through our various evaluation methods, we get the chance to hear directly from library meal participants about the benefits and the impacts of having lunches provided in libraries and at community sites. I just wanted to share a few comments with you that we've received from families regarding the program. These comments are on the slide, so feel free. I'll just give a few seconds to read through some of them. They're such great comments. Um, these comments just warm my heart and really show the significant impact on the program and the significant impact that the program has on the community. Next slide, Holly. Additionally, library staff um, share their stories with us about what it means to have the Lunch at the Library program offered in their communities. This past year, we added a question to our annual participation survey where we asked libraries to comment on why the Lunch at the Library program is an important service to offer in their community. And here are just a few of their responses, which are also displayed on the screen. Um, these stories not only tell the need for serving meals, but also show why libraries are the perfect place to host a meal service or even be a partner during the summer. Next slide, Holly. So building community and partnerships, this is such a significant part of the summer meals programs is partnerships. Summer meal programs at public libraries presents opportunities to build partnerships with meal providers, collaboration with city, county, school, special agencies and community-based organizations and local businesses. Through this fantastic work that's being done, other agencies will gain um, more knowledge and information of services and resources that the library has to offer to the community. Next slide. Also, um, to help provide overall health mentally and physically, libraries are establishing partnerships to strengthen and grow programs. Partners can help libraries introduce families to community resources, present programming, provide food for parents and caregivers, connect library staff with volunteers, and provide funding and more. Lunch at the library can also connect public libraries with school districts, as we saw that this past summer, and local community-based organizations. It strengthens collaboration within cities, counties, and special districts building our stronger communities and providing improved support for families. It also provides a great opportunity to engage community leaders and highlight the library's role as a community hub. Next slide. There's so many great examples to list, but to give you an idea, here are examples of library partnerships that give opportunities to reach different organization in your community. Um, also, I'd like to mention that your public health department could be a fantastic partner, and I highly recommend reaching out to your local public health department, also social service agencies, your parks department, state parks, and even your colleges and universities could be um, partners throughout the summer. I'm now going to turn it over to Trish, who will talk more about the library as a meal provider and programming. Thanks, Holly. Um, and you'll notice in this presentation, we have a mix of pre-COVID and COVID photos. We, we didn't want to lose sight of the chance that in the not too distant future, um, we will not be struggling with COVID related social distancing issues. So we, ha we do have a mix of slides. Um, so why library-based meal programs? For all of you that are already doing it, you, you know these reasons well. 
Um, their libraries are trusted community spaces, highly valued by your communities, and the libraries can provide a wide range of resources um, for family members. Um, summer reading programs and learning and exploration opportunities and um, are free of charge and easily accessible. And library based meal programs are a great, a great way to connect families to uh, not only your summer programs, but all of the other opportunities and resources of the library, your brain fuse job now, your free, you know, year round programming and e resources in addition to summer reading, learning, and exploration programs. Um, uh, next slide. And what we do hear from libraries, again, this is uh, the libraries that are already serving summer meals have figured this out and know this well, but for libraries not yet doing that and considering um, becoming a meal site, um, the libraries with summer meal sites um, can really connect those participants to the year round resources of the library. They report saying new families coming to the library for the first time. And it's proven to be a really wonderful way to connect to previously underserved community members. Um, this past year, um, a lot of libraries that had originally planned to use their summer meal programs as youth development um, opportunities wound up having to postpone those activities, but still um, quite a few libraries worked with their teens and used their kind of redesigned summer meal programs in the time of COVID as a youth development tool. Um, and as Carrie talked about, there's a great opportunity for new partnerships for libraries and other community-based organizations. Um, next slide, please. And obviously these are pre-COVID images, but libraries really do come in all shapes and sizes and really most if not all can work as a meal site with just a little bit of creative thinking. Um, next slide. And this sort of, we saw this with uh, with um, the pandemic, um, we really did see this play out during the summer of 2020 that even with all the COVID restrictions, libraries really found a way to not only provide meals, but really creative ways to connect part summer meal participants either at the library or out at pop-up community sites with library services and take home and grab and go activities. Um, next slide. Great, thank you. Uh, so here again is just a recap of some of what libraries did this summer and something we didn't mention is that libraries created over 11,000, libraries in California created over 11,000 virtual programs uh, with over 1.2 million views um, and again, we discussed um, the book giveaways, the take home programming kits, and the close to 400 pop up libraries that set up at community meal sites. So just to, to put some libraries and faces to these amazing numbers, we are going to turn things over to our amazing panelists at this point. Um, if you could click to the next slide, Holly. Perfect, thank you. So we're gonna hear from Patrice Chamberlain of CLA, who's gonna talk about the early learning and nutrition project and share with you ways that you can support and inspire learning and nutrition education through your library, not only your summer meal programs, but uh, year round. Um, Christine Kingsbury of Tahoma County Library is gonna share Tahoma's experience as a first year summer meal site it was quite a year to be a first year summer meal site this past summer, but they managed to do amazing things. And I think we'll share a little bit about um, what they did around programming in 2020 and what they're thinking for next summer. 
Uh, Rachel Acaza of Sonoma County Library is going to talk about Sonoma County's partnership with their schools, which I think was ongoing um, and had been established a while ago, and how they built and expanded on that um, partnership this past summer with a really large scale pop up library approach. And then finally, Dawn Vest of Monterey County Libraries is going to share how their libraries somehow managed last year. I think they actually expanded their very large scale library based summer meal program and also took pop up library programming out to meal sites. And she's going to share a bit about the programming that they offered. So uh, Patrice, do you want to get us started? Sure, and we will test my technical skills here. So I am going to race through my presentation um, uh, to keep us on track and also to prevent my Zoom loving cats um, from realizing that they may have an opportunity to um, achieve their 10 minute, their 15 minutes of fame. So um, with that, uh, thank you, Trish, for the introduction. I'm Patrice Chamberlain, um, and, and I'm gonna expand on um, the early learning and nutrition piece, you know, to expand on what Trish and Carrie were talking about as far as your partner, partnerships um, with different agencies in your community. So we started this project back in 2017 um, because what we saw, you know, in working on Lent at the Library was that Lent at the Library was drawing in new families, but they weren't necessarily taking advantage of the library's early childhood programs. And conversely, we saw that families that were participating in the library early childhood programs weren't necessarily sticking around for lunch. So we saw this opportunity to really uh, blend the two um, and make sure that they were more aligned. And I'm especially excited about this project this year um, because we know, obviously, with the pandemic that um, all kids are at risk um, for, for many things, both you know, academic losses, um, you know, mental health issues. Um, but we know also too that there has been a significant drop in three to four year olds accessing childcare and preschool programs. There's been a 25% drop according to one recent survey. And they have found that that's even worse among young children living in, in poverty. So thinking ahead about the um, potential academic losses and, and them starting out far behind. So um, as you can see, um, the goals of the project are both to increase access to healthy foods through library summer meal programs, but also to align library early childhood programs and see how we can use those programs to promote nutrition, food literacy, physical activity, and gardening through library program because we know um, health is important to um, academic out to high academic outcomes, but we also know that um, having literacy um, and you know strong social emotional development is critical to a healthy life. So um, the two are really interconnected. So exploring ways that we can continue to grow and align those efforts is really crucial. Um, and also uh, nutrition is so crucial to brain development. So making sure that um, families can really take full advantage of your early childhood programs um, by making sure that they are nourished and able to focus and concentrate um, and pay attention to, to your programs is really vital. Um, so let's see here. Um, so the first year that we started this program, our goal was really to just kind of experiment and see what we could do. So we piloted um, activities at a number of libraries across the state. Um, you can probably hear my, my guest cat speaker in the background. Um, but what we did was really uh, explored at different libraries what kind of activities um, they could do both in line with the lunch at the library program and also just as part of um, their regular early childhood programs. Um, as part of that first year, we also did a survey of parents and caregivers. And um, 
about 200 caregivers report, uh, uh, responded to our survey and 77% reported that lunch at the library increased their young child's access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So we know that um, lunch at the library has been instrumental in um, increasing access to foods um, that either kids may not have at home um, or it's not culturally familiar or they may not have access to it in their neighborhood because they live in a food desert. So we know that lunch at the library really provided actual access to foods. Um, and many parents often reported that if that, you know, at home their child hated carrots, but at lunch at the library with all the kids around them eating it, they were more inclined to eat it. So there really was this opportunity both to expose kids to new foods, but also it uh, highlighted the importance of providing that complementary nutrition education to help them want to try new foods. So these are just some of the examples of activities um, that some of the libraries um, engaged in. They had flexibility to do what they wanted. So um, one of the things that was important to our effort was really engaging caregivers in this effort. So um, there are opportunities to um, get uh, parents and caregivers talking uh, with their young children about activity, about different topics such as gardening and farming. Um, some libraries did nutrition bingo, where it was an, an opportunity to introduce young children um, to letter and color recognition um, and increase their, their vocabulary. Um, some libraries did farmers market simulations, healthy book displays, and then at uh, Monterey County Free Libraries Greenfield Branch in partnership with Don, who you'll hear from later. Um, we did a start healthy, start school healthy event at the end of the summer. Um, and we had a lot of nutrition ed activities as well as an opportunity for kids to get school supplies. Um, at that event, one parent um, told me that his uh, his child that was starting kindergarten um, was really excited about this event because this was the first social interaction that she had had with other kids all summer and it helped alleviate some of the nervousness around going to school. So I think um, especially thinking about fall, um, this fall where a lot of um, children may be starting preschool or kindergarten, there's a real opportunity um, to help ensure that they start on the right track. So um, I'm gonna run through this. So um, we have some conversation starters that we developed in partnership with Tandem Early Learning uh, to provide an opportunity at the lunch service for caregivers to talk with their kids um, about in, and kind of work on those early learning skills in the context of food. Um, so it also provides an activity for the parents to engage in during the lunch service. Um, this year, um, like everybody else, we had to pivot and we developed um, activity kits um, to go along with the grab and go meal service. And the purpose of this year's activity kits was to align with the resources that local health departments and other health agencies had already available. So these are really um, easy, inexpensive kits um, that we could um, distribute at grab and go meal service. Um, programs happening at different libraries. And we did hear from several libraries that it increased um, participation in um, their library meal program. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a, an example. Um, the San, uh, San Pablo Library had access to the USDA Farmers to Families boxes um, with an organization. So we developed an activity card um, to really make that veggie box more fun. Um, and in addition to these um, two recipe cards uh, from the California Department of Public Health, which have recipes on the back, but it was also an opportunity to um, increase that sensory education and increase vocabulary and food literacy. Um, this year, we're going to be expanding those activities as well, um, especially on the physical activity and mindfulness side, um, because after talking to um, some pediatricians, one of the things that I know a lot of them are seeing 
is uh, mental health issues, um, including among the young children, um, as well as weight gain and speech delays. So we really feel like there's an opportunity with our activity kits to address some of those um, elements. Um, we'll also be looking at exploring partnerships with um, public housing and affordable housing um, communities so we can see how we can bring that health and early learning experience um, and the library presence to, um, to low-income populations living in family housing. Um, and then we will be doing some uh, back-to-school events, um, Building Healthy Habits, Let's Start School um, events to see how we can um, ensure that young children start school in the fall uh, ready to learn and healthy. Um, so if you are interested in, in getting involved with any of those efforts, um, definitely please reach out to me. All of the resources that I did just um, uh, highlight are available on the Summer at Your Library website um, at calchallenge.org. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and my caps. And I'm going to pass it over to Christine Kingsbury, um, who is the Youth Services Manager at Tehama County Library. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for letting me share a little bit about our Lunch at the Library program. And next slide, please. Uh, the Tehama County Library is a three branch library system and we're located in rural Northern California. We have a population of about 65,000 and over 70% of the youth in our county qualify for free or reduced um, school lunches. Next slide. Like everyone else in public libraries, our summer reading program drastically changed last year, and we were really struggling with how to create a safe summer program. Um, we did receive feedback from several families that were looking for safe activities to go out and do. And having lunch at the library helped us shift our plans and create a new way to engage with families um, while also helping address food shortages in our community. Uh, next slide. Um, this was our first time participating in lunch at the library and we decided to hold it at our main branch. Um, as you can see, the parking lot is set up really well uh, for an easy drive through program, which really helped. And lunch at the library funding helped us purchase a pop up tent, table and chairs, marketing materials, uh, jumbo outdoor games and a portable obstacle course. Um, next slide please. Uh, our director, Todd Deck, really wanted us to find ways to engage with families um, during the lunch pickup time. And here's a photo of him playing Jumbo Connect Four with a family. Um, we also did a water balloon toss where we had the child throw a water balloon on a number and whatever number they landed on, they would honk their horn that many times. They love doing that. Uh, next slide. All right, um, after the families got their lunch and stopped at any staff stations, um, they were able to park and take turns um, one family at a time running through our superhero socially distanced obstacle course. And this was a really big hit with the kids. Okay, next slide. Um, our lunch drive through was a great way to partner with local agencies. Um, these agencies heard what we were doing and contacted us to see if they could have a grab and go booth during our drive through. Um, they were happy to have an event to be able to attend that complied with local COVID guidelines while getting you know, their information out to the community. Um, and when we included community partners, we always had a much, much better attendance. Next slide. All right. Um, our local TV news station covered the first drive through lunch at the library. Um, the only mistake we made was telling them to stop by any time between 11 and 12 and nearly all the 100 lunches were gone in the first 20 minutes so uh, before they even got there so next time we'll have them come right at the start but um, having lunch at the library provided a program for us to promote to the community along with all of our other services that we were offering at the time which really um, brought awareness back to the library um, and the news station said they were happy to have a positive story to report on um, during such challenging times. Uh, next slide. Um, speaking of challenges, a challenge we faced was determining how many lunches to have available each week. 
Um, at first we needed many, and then as the summer progressed, less people did come through. So calculating how many lunches to plan for was a challenge. Um, but again, anytime we included community partners, we always had much better attendance. Um, secondly, getting the word out and reaching underserved youth was a challenge. Um, since we're more rural, most families need a car to get to the library. So we may have missed serving some of our youth in need due to transportation issues. Next slide. Um, what we learned doing lunch at the library last year, we used as a model for all of our programs going forward. Here are a few things that we added to complement the drive-through programs. We now do a weekly drive-through story time where families can drive through and stop at early learning stations. They can grab a craft and visit the obstacle course. Uh, we also added an outdoor story walk, a library radio station, and a drive-in Nintendo Switch family game night. Next slide. Um, this summer, we're planning to do lunch at the library with pop-up stations to help address areas that we believe have more need. Um, our summer theme is space, and we'll be incorporating a pop-up booth, STEM grab and go, an on-site science experiment, a portable and a portable story walk. And new partners for our pop-up locations so far are Parks and Recreation and Farmers Market. Um, also, the planetarium is getting involved as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, Lunch at the library really gave us a platform for our summer reading program last year, helped feed youth in our community, and really helped build our confidence to step out and try new forms of programming. And we really appreciate it. And uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Sonoma County Education Initiatives Librarian, Rachel Ikaza. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this project because it's one of my favorite things that we do at Sonoma County Library. Um, next slide, please. For a little background on um, who and how we serve our community, so little uh, statistics about Sonoma County. We have 14 locations, 231 employees, 66 full-time librarians. Um, in 2020, the uh, community was 546,000 people. And the circulation that we have is from a couple of years ago, but we do serve a large uh, square mileage. Um, what I didn't put on here that I should have is we have 40 school districts, four zero school districts. It's a lot of different uh, communities and um, a lot of uh, concentrated wealth in certain areas and concentrated poverty in other areas. Next slide, please. Now, prior to 2020, Sonoma County Library served summer meals from eight of our library sites, and we brought pop-up library programs to four community sites for a total of 12 service points. And we've been doing that for a number of years. I think this year will be either our sixth or seventh year participating in Lunch at the Library. We've had great success. We did a lot of wonderful early childhood uh, activities, all the wonderful things that uh, Patrice, Patrice was sharing with us. We've done a lot of that in our libraries to great success and enjoyed that a lot. Brought a lot of new families into the library and um, did a little bit more partnering with our public housing agencies and, and various community organizations. But what we had noticed over the years is that we consistently were not meeting our goal about connecting summer lunch with summer reading and having more uh, participation with the summer reading activities, uh, kids logging their minutes, logging their books, families sharing books together, um, you know, book giveaways and things like that. So we, even if um, there hadn't been a pandemic, we thought, what can we do this summer to really nail that summer reading, summer lunch connection? done really well with summer lunch, how can we improve the summer reading piece? So we said, you know, looking at uh, issues with staffing, looking at uncertainty about where the meals were going to be produced because our food bank wasn't sure, the local district schools were not sure where their meals were gonna be produced. We said, what we're gonna do is just distribute books. We're gonna do what libraries do best and get books in the hands of kids and families. So that's what we proceeded to do. In summer 2020, we were able to leverage our school and community partnerships to bring free giveaway books to 40 locations. 
And those are, again, school sites where they had drive up meal service, um, different uh, housing communities, parks and rec, um, those sorts of sites. We did one farmer's market and all of this was drop off. Um, our Sonoma County Library staff, um, we were given the guidance that we should not interact with the public directly, that it would be drop off only service. And a couple of sites we were able to have the opportunity to stay for a couple of quick photos, but that was pretty much it. Um, and these new um, school connections really helped pave the way for uh, follow-up relationship building in the school year. Next slide, please. So this is a photo of uh, a little girl and her, her sibling in the car where they received uh, free books. We did make sure to provide books for all um, ages of children from toddler books to high school students. You can see she's holding up uh, some Spanish language books. We were able to distribute just shy of 10,000 books to uh, 40 sites throughout our county. Our county is a huge area and we were able to make some partnerships with some very far reaching areas that we had never had contact with before. In particular, some of our native communities in tribal lands where you really have to have permission to be on their property. So being able to contact the school superintendent and the teacher and the tribal council to say, we've got a box of books for every one of your students. You know, they received lunches. We'd like to support the meal service with free books and information about summer reading. We're bringing summer reading information and activities for the students. And the tribal leaders were like, wow, that's exciting. We would love to partner with you. And then following up with that more different ways to work together, getting all the children library cards, doing uh, professional development with the teaching staff, just kind of uh, snowballed into more and more contact. And it was um, made possible by a single box of books that was a gift from this grant. So it's really exciting what um, it's possible through this work. Next slide. There's a picture of us. Um, there's me in my blue t-shirt there and the really amazing staff at this particular school. The lady in the um, kind of lighter colored tank top there, she's the school nutrition and, um, coordinator. And for those of you that might be new to working with schools or new to this grant, I want to just give you a highlight that there is a professional at every school district. I think this is California Educational Code, that they have a professional who looks out for school nutrition. And that is a key person to get in touch with. If your um, library jurisdiction has been deemed a site and the school has also been deemed a site due to demographics, there is somebody at the school besides a principal who's very busy um, who can be your contact point. And that woman was super helpful. Um, they even went so far as to send out um, robocalls, emails, texts to all the parents to say, guess what? We've got free books for your families this week. Part of why they were so eager to partner with us is they were seeing a real drop in families picking up meals. The families were struggling to get to the site, maybe just thought it wasn't worth it, or the kids you know, were dragging their feet. And in a lot of cases, we uh, were let, it was, came to my attention that the families felt shame about needing to receive services, that they felt like, oh, again, we have to go through this pickup line. And it felt, they felt bad, but the books took the sting out of that emotion, you know, real honest feeling like that, of course, you're going to, it's a tough time. You're going to have feelings about it, but to get a free book, those families were lining up it was really exciting to see the shift in how the schools were able to serve their families through the gift of a book. It was really special, exciting experience. Next slide, please. And there is one of our, one of the best contacts I made over the summer. I'd never met this woman before. Her name's Miss Rocio. Um, and there she is giving the books to that little girl, this gorgeous little girl. And speaking to Miss Rocio, I was able to learn so much about what the community around the public library thought of the library itself. There's a library site directly across the street from this school where the um, pickup was occurring. And I, we were standing there and I said, you know, did you know there's a library right there across the street? And they said, oh, you know, we, we don't really go there. Said, really, why? Well, we're just worried about getting sick. And it's, you know, we're trying to we're go to the grocery store and we're here at school and that's really all we can do and going to work. But the community was really afraid of um, getting COVID from the library. So we were able to have the staff share a little more information about, you know, how we keep safe. 
and to allay some fears and do some more targeted welcoming efforts with that community because we just didn't understand why the circulation at that particular branch was so low given the huge community around it. But through working with the school, bringing free books, talking to the staff, even briefly, just making a connection, we learned something about further service that we didn't, that we didn't know. So that was really exciting. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up by saying, I would love, love, love for anyone who's new to this to get in touch with me. I super love this program. Um, it's one of my favorite initiatives that we do, and it's been such a journey to come from the uh, student support initiative that really connected us with our schools to lunch at the library to summer reading and to come full circle with, you know, learning more about our communities and how we can better serve them through this work. Uh, the grant staff on this uh, project are amazing, very, very helpful, very forgiving when you make a mistake or need help. Um, they're very uh, available for questions and training and support. So um, of all the grant work that I've done in my career, the Summer Lunch of the Library grant has been probably one of the easiest and the highest uh, bang for your, your buck. So highly recommend it. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. I'm gonna pass it over to Dawn Vest, who's gonna tell us more. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Dawn Vest. I'm the um, Greenfield Branch Manager and also the Program Coordinator for Lunch at the Library. And I'll just kind of <clears throat> tail off of what Rachel said. I absolutely love this program. I think it's one of the best grants as far as the benefits to the community, the benefits to the library, the benefits for being able to uh, reach uh, different partners and we're just touching the iceberg of what we can do as far as benefiting the children in our communities as well. Um, so there's just so many great aspects of this program that are wonderful and it's, I know in the beginning stages of it, it can be a little bit more work than anybody is used to, but that work is minimal when you think about the maximum benefits that we get. And as with any task or program that you do, the beginning is a little bit harder, but it becomes routine and it's really just second nature. So next slide, please. So we first started uh, uh, some, um, lunch at the library with our jurisdiction as one branch in 2017. And then 2018, we added a second branch in 2019, we tried to go jurisdiction-wide, which we almost did, but there was a couple of glitches. And then in 2020, believe it or not, with COVID, we actually did achieve jurisdiction-wide. Um, we were able to adapt to um, the COVID-19, and that is a, a lot due in part to our amazing director, who has this can-do attitude of everything is figure outable. Um, and also an assistant director who actually went out and helped pick up meals and deliver meals for us. So that enthusiasm from the top down helps grow the enthusiasm from the bottom up. And we have amazing staff and um, absolutely amazing sponsors. So that made it a, a, a challenging year, much more easy to deal with and to figure things out. So um, we went through a six week program and each week we provided different activities with the meals, like week one, and we tried to focus on different aspects of um, things to be able to provide to the children. Our first week we did different abilities and activity book. The second week was hack, um, a hacky sack and physical literacy. The third week was a flip book animation with art. The fourth week was secret coder investigating STEM. And the fifth week was an animal towel crafting maker space and our six week um, eco literacy, which we did food nutrition and we uh, were able to use a lot of the materials provided by the center for eco literacy. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in 2019, we served 7,039 7, meals. <clears throat> and with COVID happening, we had tried to figure out how to be able to do this and if we would even be able to do it. Um, so the model that we came up with was to do it jurisdiction wide one um, day a week with the grab and go with um, MCFL pre-designed grab and go activity bags. And then we were also able to give each branch a small discretionary budget so that they could purchase items and create activities that would specifically serve their community because they know their communities the best. Um, which also seems to help promote some of the enthusiasm for doing it because they have a say in it. 
Um, we also did pop-up programming models where we <clears throat> allotted the branches <clears throat> a discretionary budget and they were able to purchase the items and create the activities themselves and go out to their partner sites <clears throat> and provide the, them to, for the children. <clears throat> we um, created a lunch at the library team <clears throat> and we had buddies. So we had each um, or individual staff members being able to support three branches. So if they had any questions they needed help, <clears throat> we were able to do that. And that really split the workload and helped us be able to do this jurisdiction wide. Next slide, please. So a lot of the slides, I just want the pictures to speak for themselves because pictures say a thousand words. Um, this is one of our pop-up programming where we took the um, sticker books and National Geographic um, books to the school sites and they were very happy to receive them and to be able to hand them out to the children. Next slide, please. So some of the activity um, um, pop-up that we did was um, drawstrings bag with sports water bottle, a frisbee, slime kits and coloring books, a space case, a case that had space toys and activities, things that go, <coughs> uh, transportation wind-up toys, uh, water decal mugs and do-it-yourself do temporary tattoos, uh, stay safe and healthy, a bag with a mask, fan and a book, and physical activities of SSD style, social distancing style, was a drawstring bag with a Frisbee book and jump rope. We did origami, uh, healthy habits backpack, and art folders. Next slide, please. So there you'll see the healthy um, activities um, bag and also the happy recipients receiving them and working in conjunction with our school districts. Next slide, please. One of the things that we also did, because we serve a lot of communities that aren't connected or have low connectivity, and with having to use the connectivity for Zoom meetings, and some people are just really tired of Zoom, at least that's what our patrons have said, um, we tried to focus on unplugged coding. And in, in borrowing somebody's um, graphic here is, we are basically all computational thinker, thinkers, whether you're really into technology or not, as far as how we have to make decisions or planning. So we focused a lot, um, some of our um, pop-up programming bags on unplugged coding to be able to reach the communities that weren't connected. Next slide, please. So one of the um, activity bags that we did was how to code a sandcastle. And we included the book, How to Code a Sandcastle. So it kind of worked hand in hand where you could, um, <clears throat> Using painter's tape, you can make an eight by eight grid and then basically um, program without a computer how to get the, um, how to build a sandcastle with the movements. Okay, next slide, please. The other uh, one, it's a really easy uh, game that you can do and it requires minimal material in the pop-up eggs is a deck of cards, a toy mouse and a few yummy uh, toy treats. And the kids can, uh, one child acts as a computer, and one is the programmer. So by following the different directions of move forward, turn right, turn left, you can guide the mouse through the cards to pick up the yummy treats. Okay. Next slide, please. And then this was a good physical outdoor activity to get the kids moving or the siblings moving. Um, is All you needed is a backyard or a playground, siblings or friends socially distance. And you basically have one child as the programmer it's kind of a take off, if you will, of um, Simon Says. So the programmer tells the computers what to do and they then do it. So it kind of teaches the, the basics of coding. Next slide, please. So our jurisdictions totals uh, were on the screen there. I'm not going to go through every single one, but you can see them and the slides will be provided um, afterwards. Um, but I know I'm gonna to sing to the choir here to a lot of people who have held this program, but I would encourage anybody to, to get involved in it. Obviously there is a need out there for children. We know that when children don't um, eat, they, there are discipline challenges, there uh, the, all of the health elements that, that go along with not eating. Um, I jokingly say that Snickers uh, did a grand marketing ex, um, exit on that hangry. Um, uh, expression, pointing that expression, and, and it's true. Kids do act up when they're not, when they don't have food. We as adults sometimes 
if our blood sugar level is low or whatever, don't act um, like we normally would. Um, it's the great benefit is with the, the communities, the libraries, the partnerships formed and the opportunities out there are phenomenal. And the, the, I think one of the greatest things is the, just the joy that the kids, the thanking us and how much they appreciate the activity bags. And when the physical libraries are open, how the kids just so appreciate everything that we do for them and just the opportunities for libraries to partner with um, uh, partnerships we would never even think of to be able to provide services for our community and the children. Um, it is, I'm not trying to minimize the work that, that's involved in this, um, but as I said in the beginning, as with any project, once you get into a routine, it just becomes second nature. And if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And I love this program. I love my job. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions, I'm willing to share any of the um, resources um, to, to share time, to save time, precious time. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Beth. That was incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to take a little time just to um, allow for questions. I do see a couple of questions are, are already in the Q&A. So we encourage you to put questions there. If your preference is to raise a hand, that, that's an option too. So we'll just go through some of those questions. And just initially, let me say, just to remind everyone, um, at some point next week, you will rece receive a link to a recording of the webinar. We, uh, I guess we can also send the slides if people want that. Uh, any resources that were mentioned, we'll also include those and then some additional resources around um, grab and go programming um, materials. Um, and at this point, let's open it up for questions. So let's see, I'm gonna, thank you so much panelists. That was amazing. I feel so inspired. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories and your amazing work. Um, so I'm just gonna read some of the questions. I'm not sure if this was directed to anyone in particular. Uh, how do activities work out during some of the, I think this was when maybe Tahama County Library was presenting. How do activities work out during some of the busier times with longer lines? Um, I think because we're really kind of a smaller library, it wasn't too much of an issue. Um, they might have to wait just a few minutes, but it really didn't turn out to be too big of a problem for us. We did try to keep it moving as quick as possible. Um, you know, there was a, there was a little bit of backup, but most of the time it it came in steady, and it was it was okay for us. Okay, thank you. Um, and then another question, I believe this came in during Tahama's presentation. Who provided the food for your lunch service? Um, we partnered with our local school district, and so um, in the morning I would go over to the, the school site, and they would just make extra for us um, that they were already giving out at the school later that day, and then I transport it to the library. Great, thank you. Another question, and I think probably a bunch of people could address this. Um, while the district liked the idea of a book giveaway during drive-through meal pickup, they were concerned about the time it would take to give out books by age range, language. They wanted cars to keep driving. Has anyone solved that concern? I'll, I'd like to at least give a, a stab sure. at that one. Um, the way that we, kind of the guidance that I provided to the schools when they balked at this a little bit, I said, you know, it's really doesn't make sense uh, for COVID safety protocols for the children to sit there pawing through the boxes anyway. So what, what I suggest is that as the, the uh, family pulls up, most of these staff know these families also. So they say, oh, I know that they have a toddler, they have a first grader and a seventh grader. So they can say like, is everybody in the car? And then they go and they grab a toddler book and they, we just gave them boxes by grade and just, you get what you get and you don't get upset. 
kind of thing. And that seemed to work really well. Um, I, we didn't really have anybody say like, oh, we don't want any more books because it's been a hassle. They were just like, yeah, that worked out really well. Do you have more high school or we're out of toddler books or whatever? Before I move on, did any other panelists have anything to add? Uh, Trish, I would just add what I saw at the East Palo Alto Library, where they actually had the books prepackaged in a paper bag, you know, like K2, um, th you know, three to five. So they were actually prepackaged in bags. And then they also had that same setup um, in for Spanish language books as well. So that way they could just, it was like a grab and go bag. Great, thank you. Um, the question is, so I'm thinking this might be Tahama, how did the drive-in Mario Kart program work? We're actually gonna do it on the 12th. Um, we had it set up last fall and we got rained out. <laughs> actually had everything set up, what was about to start and it started raining on us. Um, so we're getting ready to do it ne next week. So. Hopefully it'd be fun. They're just gonna park in their cars and um, then we'll be calling them up like socially distanced, like four people at a time to play against each other and for prizes. So it's all outside. We're projecting it on the back of our library wall and it's like a huge projection. So, and we are using the radio station to, um, to broadcast the sound so they can sit in their car when they're watching their, their child or whoever that's, it's open to all ages. Um, they can sit in their car and listen, you know, to the sounds being uh, that are going out through their their radio. So hopefully, we're it won't rain this time. <laughs> nice. Um, I think this is for everybody. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, we're reluctant to take photos at meal sites. Any tips? You can take that one. Go for it. <clears throat> What we do is basically ask the, the parents at, at, or just basically say, do you mind if we take your photo? If they say yes, <clears throat> then we go ahead and take it. <clears throat> um, so it, it's just like seeking that permission first. Any other panelists about photo taking? And we just say, hi, we're just here to take a couple of photos. Would you mind, you know, everybody's masked and it, we didn't have any anybody worrying about that at all. They're just, oh yeah, thank you so much. Or, you know, if we mentioned it, maybe said that we, we, we needed it for a report because we do, <laughs> so. Great, I think it might be a problem that, that we as library people think is more of an issue than the community actually thinks is an issue. Uh, the next question, if you already have community locations, et cetera, that are serving meals, how do you know if there's still a need for the library to be a site or if it should be a pop-up library at those pre-existing sites? And this might be something we could also say to follow up with the lunch at the library staff to explore this, but I don't know if any of the panelists have anything to say. I like to speak to that one. <clears throat> a lot of it is too, is the need within your communities. <clears throat> and as, as we know by the statistics that there's definitely a need out there. <clears throat> and even if you have a school and in a recreation center across the street or even a school across the street, the need is there. So the more sites that you can have definitely helps with your um, the children getting food. So it's, I, I think anytime that you can get a sponsor and be able to provide the food is a great thing. And if I could add on to that, um, I think one of the barriers that I have seen in a lot of different communities is that parents feel like um, uh, the, the lunch program is not for them. So, you know, especially with a pandemic, um, you know, a lot of families will say, oh, I don't think my child's eligible because they may not have been, their child may not have been eligible in the past for lunch at that school. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation about whether or not kids can access the meals. And frankly, a lot of the school districts are not really great about um, really emphasizing that this is for all kids in the children and teens in the community. So there's um, this belief that is only for students that are enrolled and that qualify for free or reduced price lunch, which is 
not the case at all. And, and also thinking about to the early childhood piece, um, these, you know, kind of preschool age kids are kids that normally never got any kind of meals. So um, having the library as kind of this non-school venue, um, I think really helps community members feel like this is for all of their kids and you don't have to be a student. You don't have to qualify for free or reduced price lunch. Um, you know, there's a lot of homeschool kids, a lot of charter school kids, a lot of private school kids even that, you know, maybe they're on a, you know, scholarship or whatever. 18 year olds that are no longer enrolled, you know, they've graduated or they're just not in school. So I think having the library as a venue opens it up to a lot more families that need and would benefit from the meals, but for, you know, a lot of kind of perception barriers or school marketing barriers, um, they don't realize that this is actually open to them as well. So um, I just wanted to add that point too. Thank you. And just in the interest of making sure we get our presentation content in before 12 and to just share with everyone, all of the presenters and Lunch at the Library staff will definitely linger on the call till all the questions are answered. But for now, we'll take one more question and I'm, I am calling them in the order they were written. And this one feels like everyone should hear the response, your, your responses to this, and then we'll move on and finish up the presentation. Then we'll, we'll stay on the call for any more questions. So this question is, what is the best way to get your library leaders on board if they say that there is already a distribution at the school? And we'll go till 1145, then pause and take more questions at the end. But Again, what is the best way to get your library leaders on board if they say that there is already a distribution at the school? Um, panelists, any responses to that? I should add to that. Um, and then John, um, I'm sure you have more information to add that would be really helpful. But I think one of the reasons, or one of the ways you can get them on board is just by sharing the information we shared today through this presentation and just the library as such an inviting space to have as a meal site. And then the connection also with the resources that we have available at the library. That's very unique, unlike any other sites within our community, because you're connecting families with literacy tools, literacy resources, and other free engagement activities that these families may not have access to. Yeah, I, th I think too also it, it almost I, I don't know that this was the intention of the question, but it's almost sounds like, well, if we're not serving meals, then why are we doing this? And that's really not the case. There are lots of ways to participate and they're all equally valid and valuable. Um, doing a pop-up is really awesome. You can do, I mean, we did them completely drop and run and it was very, very impactful. Um, we were not lucky enough to have, you know, we couldn't have staff there interacting with kids and yet we still had a huge impact. Um, so to say, oh, well, if we're not serving meals and why, why, you know, why would administration allow this? Like come from the perspective of we're doing it. It's just, how are we doing it? Are we doing pop-ups? Cause we can, you know, knock, knock the ball out of the park with pop-ups if that, that's what we're doing, or we're going to figure out how to do grab and go meals, but you know, they're equally valuable ways to participate. Anyone else? Okay, I think we'll just move on. We'll try and wrap up our presentation. And we do have a little bit that we do wanna share about the um, funding reimbursement opportunities. So we just wanna make sure that gets covered. And again, we will all linger until all the questions get answered, but we just wanna cover all the content. Um, okay, so uh, reimbursement programming funds are available for summer 2021. Um, we're asking, we, again, we're not sure what the quantity will be for each available for each site. Um, so we're asking for everybody to apply for the funds by Friday, March 19th, and then we'll be able to um, evaluate all the requests and try and divide the funds in the most equitable way possible. Um, information about those reimbursement funds is on the Lunch at the Library website under the Support for Libraries tab. Um, but we will have two. We have two categories of funds available: um, reimbursement funds to support new and existing library-based summer meal programs, and also 
um, programming reimbursement funds to support pop-up library programming. Um, so any questions you, we realize like every, everyone's situation is different. If you have questions, definitely contact libraries. I mean, lunch at the library staff, but Carrie and myself and Holly do plan to, um, before definitely before the 19th do some kind of create a frequently asked questions and an, in, an informative session which we will record to kind of address any of the questions and issues that we're hearing but we really do encourage you to apply for these funds these are different than in past year the past two years the project has received state funds which have been much more flexible um, for this year, we have not received those funds, though fingers crossed, we, had, we are hoping that some state funding comes through for um, summer 22, sorry, I'm not sure, 22, yeah, summer 22, um, available for summer 22. Um, so for, for right now, we just have LSTA funds, which are much stricter in terms how those how those funds can be used but again we hope you'll apply for those funds again they're re we will reimburse you for the cost of programming supplies um, for your lunch at the library or pop-up library programming um, and we will get more information out about that and also please feel free to email us or connect with us uh, after this call if you have questions about that um, but please, if, if you're at all interested, even if you're not, if your um, pop up or meal site plans aren't completely confirmed, just put your library jurisdiction um, in the hat for those funds and fill out the uh, very, very simple application form, which is on the Lunch at the Library website. Um, next slide. And just a little bit about program evaluation. Um, we will be, so the, pro the Lunch at the Library project collects output data, which is, are the surveys we ask library staff to complete, and also outcomes data, which are the surveys we encourage you to hand out to your participants. Um, we will be definitely collecting output data this summer, and we'll continue to provide libraries with the opportunity to collect outcomes data we are just still in the process of evaluating how best to do that for summer 2021 based on the lessons we learned from summer 2020 and what was challenging for libraries because it is looking like summer 2021 might be quite similar um, in many ways to summer 2020. So we are working very hard at um, kind of fine tuning and sort of evaluating the best way and the easiest, most seamless way to do evaluation for libraries and for our project purposes. And we really hope to get you some definitive information about project evaluation by April. Um, and we do, we really appreciate, we know you had so much going on this past summer and really all your efforts at project evaluation. And we've had such a high rate of survey completion. Um, the participation and outcomes data that we do collect really becomes a really important big statewide picture and, and helps the project illustrate the need for and value of all the essential work that libraries are doing both at library meal sites, but also at, at community meal sites. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time um, and kind of navigating the sometimes confusing surveys we've sent out. And we're definitely going to try and simplify those for this coming summer. But we really appreciate you uh, providing us with that information because it really does allow us to illustrate um, the great work that you are doing. So thank you for that. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, sorry. So we do really want you to be aware of the project website and resources. Much of what we've discussed is on the Lunch at the Library website, 
Um, when we talk about resources, also really consider the project staff. As I said before, we are our sole purpose is to serve and support you so you can support and serve your communities. So please don't hesitate to shoot us an email um, and let us know how we can help. Next slide. And on the website, there's information on determining eligibility. I mean, you can see the list just because we're short on time and I want to get to your questions. Uh, we are uh, in the process of updating our flyers. There'll be flyers to promote your programs. Um, again, the application for applying for the LSTA reimbursement funds is also on the website. Um, there's some programming ideas. Uh, you can sign up for the Lunch at the Library listserv on the website. Um, and there, anyway, there's a host of information there. So that's a really good tool to explore. And next slide. Oh, I'm going to hand this. I'm going to let Carrie. Oh, yeah. yeah so we also um, will share out some information on summer meals during COVID and how to address um, serving meals. Um, during this time. And also on this slide, we do have links that um, will tell you some more information about the nationwide waivers that are in place. Especially in California, we have waivers that are in place that have changed some of the ways that we're serving meals and allowing us to have greater access and flexibility with serving meals. We're hoping many of those waivers are extended. We have yet to know if they'll be extended past June, but we hope to find out that information soon and we will definitely share that information with you. And then also when getting started, um, something a site that you could look at is the USDA's Meal Site Finder and you could find in your community where all the meals are being served, where all the summer meals are being served. And your library site should also be located on the Meal Finder. Next slide, Holly. Um, these are some additional lunch and healthy food resources. March is National Nutrition Month, so it's a great time to do programming, um, nutrition programming, and you could tie it into um, the meals program or the programs that you plan on doing this summer. And then also on here, we have the CDE California Meals for Kids mobile app. That's another way that you could find um, meals within your community, and you could share that with your community members. Lunch Assist, I highly recommend looking on their site. Um, they host um, monthly webinars and conversations with nutrition specialists within their communities. And they share updates regarding waivers and different policies, nutrition policies, and different policies and resources are also available on the site for you to view. And next slide, Holly. Oh, and then also, I don't, oh, there it goes. Um, share your photos with us. We do have an Instagram page. So it's Lunch at the Library, California. And um, if you want to send photos in, we're happy to post them, but you could also tag us because we love seeing all of the wonderful work that you're doing in the summer. And thank you everyone for attending. This has been a great session. Yeah, thank you, Annette. Well, it, please feel free to linger. We still have some <laughs> questions to get to. Again, um, slides, uh, the slides and the webinar will be sent out to you uh, at some point next week. We'll be sharing any resources that were mentioned today. Um, and we really, we understand and know that you are hungry for great um, grab and go activities. So we're just in the process of just trying to figure out the best way if it's a dedicated networking conversation, if it's a Slack channel, if it's a Google Drive, how to, how to really create a community where you're all sharing your grab and go ideas so everybody can sort of benefit from the wealth of those ideas. So uh, you will hear more news on that very soon. If you have an idea for sharing those ideas or you've worked on another project that it worked well where we could get, sort of get statewide sharing of best practices for grab and go programming, uh, please put that in the chat. We'd love to know uh, if you have recommendations for a good way to do that. And also on March 18th, um, we have another Summit Your Library networking conversation planned and Holly will be promoting that in the ne uh, early next week. So that's always a good opportunity to share ideas. And we will do some dedicated Lunch at the Library conversations as well. Um, for you to all network and share what you're thinking and planning. Um, so yes, and echoing um, 
Carrie's comments. Thank you so much for joining us today. And at this point, I am going to pick up where we left off on questions. And thanks so much for our panelists for staying on the call. Um, so anyway, thank you, everyone. And uh, what is the best way to get? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Into that. Uh, what is the best time to hold your grab and go? I don't know. Um, well, if you're talking about picking up meals, like the, the meal service time is very finite and your service provider will tell you exactly how long those hot meals can be out of the meal container before they have to be either distributed or thrown out. So your grab and go meal time is, is prescribed if you're doing hot food. If you're talking about like, when would it be a good time to have just like activities that folks can pick up? I don't know about that. That's, that's tough. And also, I guess at this point, if you so definitely putting your questions in the Q and A works. You could also raise your hand, and Laura, if you wanted to expand on that question, uh, you could raise your hand. Um, and if someone could monitor the raised hands, we do have one hand raised. Okay, but uh, so thanks, Rachel, for answering that. Um, so Trish, I've I've uh, got a vet on the line. She raised her hand. Hey, hi Trish, it's Eva. Oh, hi. Um, I have a quick question. I know that there's two um, libraries that would like to participate at the grab and go meal sites, but we're not sure if they will be able to participate. Yes, yeah, so if there are, are you asking this because you're interested in funding? Yes, for the two libraries that we have. Okay, so if you, all I would at this point, I would say ha, um, for Madera County Library to include them when they fill out the application, we ask you to kind of in parentheses put if it's tentative or confirmed, and that's helpful for us to know. But definitely go ahead and include them in your request for funding, and you'll just indicate that it's tentative. And that'll just be really helpful for us to define how to decide how we can equitably divide, divide the funding. And then we might follow up with you closer to March 19th to see if you know any more. So definitely include them in any application. Okay, because we did, um, I tried um, looking in the map if they would qualify, but I don't, I didn't see anything um, if they would. I know oh, that- I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. So you're wondering if they would qualify. Mm -hmm. So you could, shoot us an email or a text, Carrie could look into that and help with that. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I will do that. I'll text Carrie. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And I'm just gonna go, just cause they were probably um, submitted earlier than the raised hands. I'm just gonna go through the um, Q and A. Um, do, book do bookmobiles qualify as a library site for funding? Yes, they do. Okay, that was an easy one. Um, any ideas for a small parking lot and a small staff? It's all about capacity and making sure library leaders understand how important grab and go is. I can talk about that really quick. Um, we did use our, our bigger library that had a, a great parking lot that wrapped around, which was great. But this year we're gonna be going to more out to our branches that are much smaller and do not have a good situation. So we're looking at um, like pop-up locations at like the community pool or farmer's market or like kind of where, where kids are hanging out to maybe reach people we haven't traditionally um, been able to reach. And then, and then it kind of solves that problem with we really, our parking lot wouldn't work for those libraries. So, you know, pop-ups may be the best thing to do. Great, thank you. I can also uh, help with that one. We have a um, couple of libraries that don't have large parking lots and that are actually in shopping centers or shopping outlets, if you will. <clears throat> so we obviously can't do a grab and go with that, but we do have walking people so they can um, uh, park their cars and then come and get the lunches. And that worked out very well. And if you feel that you don't have enough staff for any of what you've just heard, which it, it's challenging, um, 
just drop stuff off. That's what we did. I mean, we, we didn't even open our libraries until I think uh, July second, second or third week of July last summer. So um, this girl right here just did it all. You just <laughs> pick one person in admin or somewhere and to say, this is, you're just going to drop stuff off. And that, I mean, I stood, we got a stamp. It was really it's this beautiful stamp and I stamped every single book and I packed them all. And I, you know, you just one person, you know, Thank you. Um, this is a comment. If the powers that be just viewed this presentation, they should have no question about the importance and impact on the library and food distribution. Just my humble opinion. Thank you. Okay, that wasn't a question statement, but anyway, I shared it. Um, would the uh, next question with the healthy act uh, the healthy activity kits that were discussed today, jump ropes, frisbees, et cetera, be allowed under LSTA pop-up library funds. Um, so what we're realizing is each with, so the LSTA funds are designed to reimburse programming supplies that are integral to your program. So if you are, if, and how you frame it, which is important because it's how you're gonna develop your outcomes and so forth, but how you frame it is really important. So if you are offering a grab and go activity, health and wellness fitness kit, um, and have some information on how the jump ropes might get used or whatever. Those items, if they're integral to your program would be allowed. But uh, what we are going to have to do and I encourage you to do if you have any questions about what you're thinking or envisioning to, um, yeah, it feels wrong to just answer this in a broad sweeping way. I, oh, we kind of need to know the nuances of your particular program how you're framing it and when you're giving out those supplies are you giving any guidance are, are you framing it that those items really are integral to whatever your program is but the potential for those to be allowable definitely is there it's just a question of how those items are structured in your activity so we um uh yes uh, if when in doubt please contact us um and ask us, but yes, if framed as an, you know, and if it is an integral part of whatever you're designing, yes, those would be allowable. Um, next Chris, question. Can I, can yeah. I add on to that just as Please. another possible resource for that? So um, for those of you that might decide to work with your um, health department, they too may be able to, to purchase some of these things if they are health related. Um, or they may already have them on hand. Like I do know that they can purchase um, like seeds for gardening. So seeds and, you know, compostable pots like we used um, in our project last year, possibly water bottles. I know they've got Potter the Otter books, but they may already have some stuff um, through their SNAP-Ed. And for those of you who aren't familiar with SNAP-Ed, it's nutrition education. So there's a $5 cap on those purchases. Um, but that's something definitely to ask your local health department if they have things like jump ropes or seeds or water bottles, um, because that can be um, another possible financial resource for you. Great, thank you. That's super helpful. Thanks, Patrice. Um, the next question, can we apply for pop-up funds if we don't know exactly how many or which specific sites we're working with? We plan to partner with LASD again and the number of sites might depend on the available funds, not vice versa. Um, I would again say, and the, the deadline's March 19th. I, I understand it's hard. It's like a chicken and the egg thing. Like, well, we don't know how much we're getting to know if we can even do it, but we really hope to give you a response if you've submitted an application after the 19th, once we know how many people have expressed interest in the funds, we'll have a good sense of what can be um, given to individual, what can be reimbursed at individual sites. So I, I think Carrie, Holly and I'll work very quickly by the beginning of 
by the end of um, March or early April to let you know what you would potentially be, be awarded. So I would just say, even if it's tentative and even though it's in a fun, it's like a funny scenario, you're not sure if you can do it unless you know what you're gonna get. We can't tell you what you'll get unless you submit an application. So even if it's tentative, I would just say, put it in um, and then early, yeah, and then we can work from there. But I, anyone, even with tentative plans, just please put them in because we can't even give you helpful information if you haven't submitted the request. And I understand it's, cha it's a challenging scenario if that makes sense. Um, and there's a question. Uh, we don't have enough staff to do that, but I don't know what that refers to. Uh, I think that was about the, the grab and goes from before. It was just a oh, subsequent okay. question. Yeah, okay, I think we it. handled it. Um, then Holly or Carrie, can you just check to see if there's any raised hands? There are no raised hands. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Does anyone want to raise their hand before we say goodbye? We are here to respond to any questions you might have. Anything else? No, oh, okay. Well, thank for those that remain on the call, thank you so much. Uh, we'll send out a the related resources and the webinar to you um, next week. Um, thank you so much for all your good work. I know all our panelists are happy and eager to be in touch with you if you want to follow up and ask them anything about how they navigated summer, what their plans are, anything they mentioned in their um presentations uh and also lunch the library staff are here for you so please don't be shy to get in touch with any or all of us um thank you thanks presenters you were amazing real inspiration much appreciated and i'm just gonna go through and I didn't properly um right